Today, I want to talk about uh, some of the work that I did during my, my postdoc at Princeton. Um, and then I want to talk about some of the more uh, recent results from uh, Copenhagen. And so the kind of the, the, the common theme for all this work is um, these nanowire-based quantum devices, um, and basically integrating those into uh, superconducting uh, microwave circuits. And so this work is done with a lot of uh, co-workers and collaborators. Um, <coughs> as a Princeton, the work is done in Jason Tedder's lab there. Um, I should men mention Michael Schroer. Uh, in addition to, to building a, a UHV MOCVD reactor uh, for growing high-quality nanowires, I uh, was also heavily involved in the, the fabrication of analog devices and, and measurements. And then the, the later uh, photon emission experiments um, from Princeton were done with uh, Yingyi Liu. Um, and then the experiments uh, in Copenhagen um, were done at the Center for Quantum Devices there, which is led by Charlie Marcus. And he's really uh, sort of pushed the project I've been working on there and enabled things to go very quickly. Um, and I should highlight that, that Peter Krogstrup uh, grew these very high quality um, novel nanowire materials that were crucial for the experiments there. And the experiments have been done with uh, Robert Larson, who uh, also made these quite challenging uh, devices. So this is an outline of my talk today. Um, first, I'll give a brief introduction to circuit quantum electrodynamics. Uh, which is this architecture that we uh, integrate our nanowire-based qubit devices into. Um, I'll then uh, describe this uh, hybrid uh, nanowire uh, circuit QED architecture that we um, explore a lot of uh, interesting physics with. I'll then show you how we can use this hybrid architecture uh, to probe single spin dynamics. And then finally, I'll, I'll talk about um, this most recent work in Copenhagen um, in which we've been using these semiconductor nanowires to make superconducting qubits. <coughs> so, uh, very briefly, circuit QED basically uh, consists of a, a superconducting transmission line resonator, and that's the, the antinodes of this resonator where you have maximum electric field. You basically place your uh, qubit. And so the idea is that these qubits or artificial atoms um, can then interact with uh, microwave photons uh, that are inside these cavities. And uh, this is, of course, um, it's quite analogous to um, more traditional cavity quantum electrodynamics, where you have uh, actual atoms interacting with light inside high finesse uh, optical cavities. And so you can describe this system using the James Cunning Hamiltonian, where uh, you have your cavity as a harmonic oscillator. You have your qubit, um, and then you have this qubit cavity interaction term, uh, which is characterized by this uh, coupling parameter G. And so G is basically the product of the qubit transition dipole moments and the RMS uh, 0.0 electric field uh, of the cavity. And so ideally, you want to be in this uh, strong coupling regime where this G is uh, much greater than both the qubit and the cavity decay rate. Um, and so in this strong coupling regime, uh, you can have basically a, a coherent uh, exchange of a single quantum of energy uh, between the qubit and the cavity. And so circuit QED has now been for around for you know, just over 10 years. Um, and in the context of qubits, it's, it's interesting for uh, a number of reasons. In particular, um, in the regime where the, the qubit and cavity frequencies are detuned, um, you have a, a, a qubit state dependent uh, shift of the cavity resonance. And so by probing the transmission through the cavity, uh, you can do readouts uh, on the qubit. Um, and additionally, if you place uh, a number of qubits along the cavity, um, the cavity can act as sort of a, a quantum bus and mediate uh, interactions between uh, different qubits. And so, just some examples of uh, some circuit QED circuits uh, from IBM and Dell. And so, here are uh, four superconductor qubit devices where each uh, qubit has a cavity uh, for readout, and the qubits are coupled via, uh, in this case, a single bus or, I think, multiple buses. 
And it, it's also worth highlighting that um, a number of sort of hard, a number of hardware tools and uh, techniques have been developed around this S3 architecture. So this includes these uh, near quantum limit amplifiers, uh, the Joseph Kalinowski amplifiers, um, and micro photon counters, um, which you know really enable you to do sort of um, photon statistics experiments using micro photons. Um, and additionally, you can also do um, weak measurement experiments and, and kind of feedback to, in this case, generate uh, the system's coherent radio oscillation. So <coughs> there's uh, sort of naturally a lot of interest um, in integrating other types of quantum systems into the circuit theory of the architecture. And here's one example in which um, since they're trying to couple an ensemble of spins, um, in this case, energy sensors and diamonds uh, to a microwave resonator. Uh, so basically, in this case, create a, a quantum memory. Um, but the, in, in the case of our work, we're really interested in trying to couple uh, single spins, uh, single spin qubits uh, to these microwave cavities. <coughs> and so, um, in order to basically isolate uh, single spins, um, we use uh, quantum dot devices, and um, here shows a fairly typical example where you might have a, a two-dimensional gap in the uh, gallium arsenide, the aluminum gallium arsenide tetrastructure, and then you have this surface depletion gate, and if you apply negative voltage to this gate to deplete the underlying two deck, uh, you can end up with this tunnel of charge, which is your quantum dot, um, in which you can isolate single spin. And uh, this quantum dot is typically coupled to reservoir where electrons can tunnel on and off. And you can also um, have a nearby charge sensor that allows you to basically see uh, these tunneling processes. <coughs> um, we quite commonly work with double quantum dot devices where you have two tunnel coupled quantum dots. Um, each is also coupled to a, a reservoir. And if you um, map the detector signals from some left to right gate voltages, uh, you can map out this uh, fairly typical charge theory diagrams where you have these stable uh, numbers of, of charge on the quantum dot, and out here is where you basically empty both of the quantum dots. And so <coughs> there's, there's a lot of interest in using these uh, spins in quantum dot devices um, for quantum information processing. Um, and sort of early results demonstrated uh, you could do a single spin coherent rotation um, as well as uh, two spin qubit um, coherent operation uh, using nearest neighbor exchange coupling. And the, I think that the motivation for, for trying to use uh, spins for quantum processing is that uh, for a solid state system, uh, very long uh, spin lifetimes and coherence times have been demonstrated. So, in order to try and couple spin qubits um, to these microwave cavities, the, the approach we followed was uh, this proposal from Chris et al., where uh, the idea is to basically uh, take advantage of the strong uh, speed onward interaction in materials such as indium arsenide nanowires to effectively couple um, the electric field of the cavity uh, to the spin qubits. And the basic idea is that <coughs> um, the spin and orbital degrees of freedom are uh, mixed due to the uh, strong spin over coupling. And so by uh, perturbing the electron wave function uh, using the electric field, uh, you can drive spin rotations. Um, and, this, and in this way, uh, spin cavity coupling strengths on the order of a megahertz uh, have been predicted. So the indium arsenide nanowires that we uh, used at Princeton were grown using this uh, home-built uh, UHV MSDVD reactor. Um, and in Copenhagen, the wires are grown using MBUs. And in both cases, you can produce very high-quality uh, single crystal indium arsenide nanowires. And it, it, it's worth uh, comparing the, the properties of indium arsenide crystal with gallium arsenide. Um, and so you can see you have the 
very low effective mass, which means you can expose some confinement. Uh, you have a very large T factor, which means you can work at much lower magnetic fields. And you have this very short uh, spin orbit length, which means you have strong spin orbit coupling and can drive uh, fast spin rotations in the electric fields on sort of nanosecond time scales. And so <coughs> we typically work with these EMR flow nanowires um, to make double quantum dot devices using this uh, bottom gated geometry. And so the basic idea is you fabricate large arrays of these um, bottom gated arrays, you then kind of randomly scatter nanowires on your substrate. And what you find is that some of them will sort of land um, conveniently across um, some of these bottom gate patterns. And so then you can contact those patterns, those wires. And um, using these bottom gate electrodes, you can then define a uh, double well potential uh, within the net wire. And so again, as you, you um, in this case, you know, there's a current through the wire. Um, as a function of smart gate voltage, you can map out the charge stability diagram uh, for these devices, uh, typically in the, the pure electron regime. So the, the, the hybrid um, architecture that we typically work with is shown here. So what you have is a uh, superconducting lambda uh, over two uh, transition line resonator. And that one of the antinodes of this resonator is where we fabricate our uh, double quantum dot device. And so in, in, the, in the case of this device, we um, couple the source and strain of the nano wire um, to the center pin of the resonator and the, the ground plane of the resonator. <coughs> and there are basically two ways in which we can probe the system. First, we can uh, measure transmission through the resonator and extract phase and amplitude information. And second, we uh, have this inductor at the node of the resonator, and this allows us to, to bias the resonator and um, in turn apply a source strain bias across that double quantum dot and also measure current through the double quantum dot. <coughs> so if we if we uh, tune this nanowire as a double quantum dot device, um, as a function of electron light gate voltages, we can again map out this charge stability diagram with um, every current with current at each of the vertices. Um, and then if we look at the transmission through the cavity, in this case looking at the phase response, uh, we can again map out that same charge stability diagram. And so if we zoom in at uh, one of these interdot charge transitions, um, we see there's a very strong response along the interdot charge transition. And basically, if we, we cut across this interdot charge transition along this detuning axis, um, we're essentially pushing an electron from one dot uh, to, the, uh, to the other dot. <coughs> and we can think of the system as a sort of simple uh, charge qubit, where our zero and one states um, are defined by whether an electron is in the left dot or the right dot. And so this system has this very simple um, energy diagram where uh, we can control the detuning and this, uh, this tunnel coupling parameter by uh, changing our gate voltages. And so uh, if we bias the double quantum dots of deep and small blockade so, such that the, the cavity and the qubit are not interacting, uh, what we see is a sort of bare cavity resonance that's around 6 gigahertz um, with a, cav a cavity Q of around a couple of thousand. <coughs> if we then bias the interrupt charge transition, uh, what we see is basically a shift in the cavity resonance and a, a change in the damping. And so we can understand this response um, by basically thinking about this uh, double quantum dot as having this uh, detuning dependent AC susceptibility that, that modifies the cavity resonance. Um, and so it's kind of remarkable that um, a single charge moving in this quantum dot can affect this, the cavity which is, you know, over 10 millimeters uh, in size. <coughs> so uh, if we look at the phase response along the interlock charge transition as we vary the interlock tunnel coupling, uh, what we see is, is this um, change in the sign of, of the phase response, um, essentially as we tune the, the tunnel coupling energy uh, through the cavity resonance. 
And so if we go back to the gentleman Hamilton, um, we can develop a model for the system. And by fitting these data sets, uh, we can extract the parameters for our, our cavity coupled um, double quantum dot charge qubits. And so uh, in the case of this device, we can, we can measure a, a charge cavity uh, coupling rate that's on the order of 30 megahertz. Unfortunately, however, these uh, double quantum dot charge qubits have uh, very short coherence times um, as they're strongly affected by uh, low frequency charge noise. And so, and, and this really sort of prevents us from accessing the, the strong coupling regime uh, in the system. So what we can also do is apply a silicon bias um, across the double quantum dot. And if we look at transport, we can observe these uh, fairly characteristic finite bias triangles. If we then look at the uh, transition through the cavity, we observe this response. And here we're plotting the amplitude squared uh, normalized to the, the um, double quantum dot basically deep in quantum blockade. Um, what we see is that um, on the positive side of the, the tuning here, there are these kind of red stripes where um, the transmission um, exceeds one. And that kind of suggests that we have uh, gain in this system. <coughs> and so what we can think of is that basically this source band bias is um, incoherently pumping this double quantum dot charge system uh, into this excited state. Um, and resulting in basically photon emission uh, into the cavity. And so these experiments that we did were inspired from by uh, early work from NEC where they coupled a super nothing charge qubit uh, to a microwave cavity. And in that case, they can also apply a source of bias um, across their super nothing charge qubit uh, to drive it to its excited state. And um, in this way, they could create population inversion um, and observe lasers. <coughs> so the, the student I was working with uh, on this project, she um, tried to develop a model to better, uh, sort of more quantitatively understand the response we observed. And um, so basically taking our, our cavity coupled uh, charge group model from before and then adding this uh, incoherent pumping term um, as to the transformatica here. And so first what we can do is we can um, take the data at zero bias and, and fit the response. And from this we can extract the sample parameters. As you can see, we can, we can um, fit these data quite reliably to you know, fairly accurately um, determine the sample parameters. Um, but then what we find is that um, in the case where it's the bias applied, the, the model does not reliably um, the, the gain that we observe. <coughs> and um, very recent theoretical work has, has uh, shown that in order to sort of understand this response, uh, you need to account for um, photon emission processes where you also have uh, simultaneous uh, phonon emission. And this is sort of consistent with the with, you know, early experiments with these pinwheel devices where um, elastic relaxation is really dominated by uh, phonon emission. So what we can also do is <coughs> retune the device such that we have much higher current um, running through it, in this case around 8 nanoamps. And, this, and in this case we see a much substantially higher gain, um, around about 15 of these so-called hotspots. And what we also see these hotspots is that um, the cavity Q is substantially higher, um, suggesting that we have uh, basically photon emission into the cavity. And indeed, if you, instead of um, driving the cavity and measuring the gain, you just um, stop driving the cavity and measuring photon output uh, from the device, you can get, again observe these hotspots where um, you have a photon emission rate of about 10 megahertz above our, our noise floor. And so um, from this data, it suggests that you have about two photons on average um, in the cavity. Um, but of course, this emission rate is much lower than the the current we're pumping through the double quantum dot, um, suggesting we have very low emission efficiency, um, which is consistent with sort of phonon emission processes dominating. <coughs> nonetheless, this data and 
Um, the, the gains test we have uh, simulated emission in the system. And it's, it's worth highlighting um, some very recent follow-up experiments from Jason Pettis' group where uh, what they basically did was uh, instead of having just one double quantum dot in the cavity, uh, they now have two double quantum dots coupled to the cavity. <coughs> and so in this case, um, if you have one of the double quantum dots on and the other off, you observe the gain of around 10 as before. Um, but then if you have both double quantum dots on, um, the gain is almost about a thousand. Um, in this case, exceeding the sort of individual gains of the double dot. And, and basically, um, the additional gain medium, uh, you can exceed the threshold uh, for latent. And so I, I was in, involved in this work, but I just wanted to highlight it. I think it's a, it's a very exciting result. <coughs> so what we can also do is use this hybrid architecture um, to probe single spin dynamics. And so to do this, we, we consider this um, level diagram where we have two excess electrons um, in our double quantum dot with the magnetic field applied. And in order to get some split state selectivity, uh, we can note that at zero the tuning, um, the singlet state and our triplet state um, will have different uh, AC susceptibility. Um, and this is essentially because if you're in the triplet state, uh, tunneling at zero the tuning is blocked uh, due to the poly exclusion principle. And, and the best way you can sort of see this effect is if you have zero magnetic fields and your ground phase is singlet, if you can observe a, a strong response at zero the tuning. <coughs> However, if you then tunnel the magnetic field so that uh, this up up triplet state becomes your ground state, uh, you see the response is strongly suppressed. And so, um, as I mentioned, if in, in these indium arsenide and ally quantum dots, you have strong spin orbital coupling, which enables you to do um, fast uh, spin rotations using electric fields. And so you can uh, combine this with um, this cavity uh, readout mechanism. And so the basic idea is that you <coughs> starting at zero to tuning, such that you're in this up up triplet state, uh, you pulse the side of tuning, apply some uh, spin resonance microwave burst. And then you pull back to zero the tuning uh, to read out. And this way you can map out the, the spin resonance condition um, as a function of magnetic field. And additionally, what you can do is if, uh, you're on, if your spin resonance uh, is on resonance per, per qubit and you vary the, the pulse length, you can observe these coherent radio oscillations. Um, and again, because of the strong spin coupling, uh, the, the Radio period you can achieve is very fast, around 17 nanoseconds. So, this type of spin readout um, is not a sort of direct demonstration of uh, spin cavity coupling, um, which is, of course, what we really want. And, <coughs> but, but nonetheless, we, we can, based on our sample parameters, come up with estimates for the spin cavity coupling in the system. And, and so based on our parameters, we estimate this is around a couple hundred kilohertz. And there's, there's a, a couple of possible ways you can increase this to say around a megahertz, um, either by going to a, a high cavity frequency or using a, a double quantum dot geometry. But the, the real concern if you want to you know, uh, reach this strong coupling regime is that uh, for materials such as indium arsenide nanowires, the, the inhomogeneous uh, evasion times are very short, uh, around a few nanoseconds. Um, and this is, of course, most likely due to the fact that you're coupled to this um, vast nuclear spin. And so, so one uh, possible solution we've been exploring a little bit is to, um, instead of these electron spins in the mass side, uh, use holes in domain silicon quartz nanowire. And, and the advantages here is that, um, of course, with domain and silicon, you can um, eliminate nuclear spin, um, but it, this material also predicts that strong spin over coupling. Um, and, so, and so this is kind of a promising direction, but, but so far these materials have proved a little bit trickier uh, to work with. Um, so 
So now I want to uh, change topics a little bit and um, talk about our more recent experiments in Copenhagen, um, exploring supernova qubits, um, and in particular, uh, transmom qubits. And so the, the transmom is really a sort of <coughs> optimized version of an number type of qubit, the, the Cooper pair box charge qubit. And so, and that basically consists of a uh, supernova island that's coupled to supernova reservoirs, uh, these these ghost convention elements. And so, in the case of the Cooper pair box charge qubit, uh, you can define your zero and one states um, by whether you have n or n plus one uh, Cooper pairs on this island. And it's kind of it's quite similar to our, our semiconductor double quantum charge qubit. And indeed, this is the, I think the first sort of single solid state system in which coherent oscillations are observed. And so both the Cooper pair box charge qubit and the trans one uh, can be described using the circuit term here, where uh, this region of the circuit is the island and it's coupled to, to ground via these ghost induction elements. And then you also have this chunk of the patch with us. And the relevant energy scales are the uh, Gerson coupling energy given by the, the critical current and the, the charging energy, which is largely determined by quantum capacity. So in the, the case of the uh, Cooper pair box, the, the ratio of EJ to EC is around about one. And so if you <coughs> plot the energy level diagrams as a function of an external gate voltage, um, it looks something like this. And what you see is that um, the splitting between the ground state and the first excited state is strongly dependent on gate voltage. And that means that if, if, um, the, if you have fluctuations in your gate voltage or um, nearby power traps, the, uh, they'll affect the splitting of your qubit and, and result in um, in homogeneous phasing. Um, in the case of the transmon, the this ratio of EJ to C is uh, much closer to 100. And that results in these um, energy bands that are much flatter. And, and basically, your uh, sensitivity to charge noise is exponentially suppressed. And so you, you can think of the transmon as sort of a uh, weakly anharmonic oscillator in which the, the cosine potential of the uh, Gerson junction lifts the degeneracy um, in the splitting between uh, suspected energy levels. And so while the, the transmon um, has no DC response, uh, importantly, it still couples to the AC electric field. And so in the sort of the limit where you, could, you think about the, the transmon as a harmonic oscillator, um, it's, you can think of it as an analogy with a mass on a string whereby um, slow adiabatic displacements don't change the amplitude of the oscillations. Um, but if you drive around resonance, you can uh, increase the amplitude of the oscillation, uh, which basically corresponds to driving between states. And so in the case of the transmon, the anahomicity, uh, which is basically the difference between uh, the 0, 1 and the 1, 2 levels, is, is given by the charging energy, which is typically on the order of a couple hundred megahertz, which allows you to drive uh, rotations between states on sort of uh, two nanosecond time scales. So a, a fairly typical transmon looks something like this where you have this large uh, interdigitated sort of shunting capacitor. And then um, in here is where you have your Gerson junction. And typically the Gerson junction is arranged in this sort of uh, squid loop. <coughs> and, and that basically enables you by threading flux through the squid loop, um, gives you a, a flux tunable effective Josephine coupling energy. And so that basically allows you to tune the, uh, the qubit splitting energy. And it, it's worth highlighting that in the case of transmons and pretty much all other supernova qubits, um, <coughs> they, they're all made using the same material technology and, the, and almost always the same fabrication process. And, and so it's typically this shadow evaporation process where um, you rotate your sample to one angle, you evaporate aluminum, uh, you then oxidize the aluminum to form a aluminum oxide tunnel barrier. And then you rotate to another angle and you evaporate the, the top uh, aluminum electrode. Uh, and then so then where the regions where the top and bottom electrodes overlap is where you form your Gerson junction. 
And, and this process is quite successful and, and um, chip enough in qubits have, have so far been very successful in particular trans bonds. And um, here, for instance, is a sort of state of the art um, implementation from um, the Santa Barbara group where they have a, a five qubit device and um, we're able to demonstrate very high fidelity one and two qubit gate operations and uh, quite long coherence times as well. Um, but of course, in Copenhagen, we um, work with semiconductor materials, <coughs> and and one problem that has generated a lot of interest recently is um, this idea of using these uh, Majorana bound states for uh, topological quantum computing, and <coughs> and so the the sort of um, idea to, to create these layer on bound states um, that we've been following and, and many other groups have been following is to, to take a strong spin orbit semiconductor such as in the mass night or in the antimonide and contact that with um, a, a superconductor. And then in the presence of a, a Zeeman field, um, the system should be able to support these layer on bound states. And indeed, um, experiments, for instance, in Delft and other groups have. Um, demonstrate evidence for these Majoranas in the form of these uh, zero bias peaks. <coughs> but, but one of the concerns that emerged from um, this data and, and other experiments was that um, below the supernatural gap, as indicated by these arrows, um, that the proximitized nanowire has a fairly significant um, conductance, suggesting that there's a fairly high density of states uh, below the supernatural gap. And so this is kind of turned to a soft gap. And um, theory basically predicted that the, the reason for this soft gap was um, due to basically a poor poly interface between the superconductor and the semiconductor. And so this motivated our uh, MBE growth to develop this new material system where you basically grow an NMR sign nanowire and then um, in the same MBE system without breaking vacuum you epitactically grow this aluminum shell around the nanowire. <coughs> and so telling experiments from um, some of my colleagues in Copenhagen uh, showed that using these epitaxial wires, um, you get a much lower uh, subject density of states um, compared to uh, with more conventional um, nanowires with evaporated uh, contacts. And so, the, the development of this material system where you have this, you know, uh, pristine interface between a, a semiconductor and a superconductor uh, motivated us to try to think of other applications for these materials. And um, we, we decided it'd be interesting to try to make transmog qubits uh, with this system. And so the, the idea is very simple. Um, <coughs> you, you take one of these echo taxal wires with you know, like four and aluminum shell, and basically you move a segment, a small segment of the aluminum shell, and then, um, and so this then forms a uh, superconductor, uh, semiconductor, superconductor, Josephson junction, um, and then you basically just shunt this with the capacitance to form a, a transmog. And what's interesting about the system is that uh, using this uh, gate, you can tune the carry density in wire, and in this case, uh, tune the, the Josephson coupling energy for this qubit. So why, why might this be a interesting thing to do? Um, so one, one thing to note is this, if you uh, consider current implementations of uh, these transmog qubits, they, um, as I mentioned, they have these squid loops to, to tune the um, qubit frequency. Um, and these are controlled using these fox bias lines, which um, at the moment have about one to ten milliamp milli uh, per qubit. So you, you can imagine if you, you know, scale this up to many qubits, um, you can have very high currents running at, at you know, millikelvin temperatures. Um, and so another potential application of, um, so yes, yeah, so if, if you move to sort of voltage control at uh, those conjunctions, you, you can eliminate this problem and, and you, know, you should have much less dissipation. Um, another potential advantage is uh, that um, since you take 
can use uh, these recently developed Kaiken multiplexes to, to control many qubits using uh, fewer control lines um, at, at the Kaiken exposure. <coughs> and, and of course, the other motivation for developing these, these nanowire based qubits is that um, there's a lot of theoretical proposals for uh, integrating Majorana into these supermassive transmog circuits. And so if you can make your transmog using the same material system, that should ensure that you know, everything works in your high magnetic field uh, required to support these Majorana. And so, so this is kind of what I guess what we've been working on for the past several months now. And, and I think the, you know, the real, the major technical challenge with um, making these transmog was um, this etch process that we used to uh, basically form this, this Gerson junction. And so the, we, we etch away the shell using a wet etch process. Um, and it can be quite challenging because the, the, the etch can run very rapidly along the, um, the shell of the wire. Um, so this is a, a, a problem that the, the PhD student, Bob uh, Larson, was, was working on. And, um, through very careful work, managed to get very good control of this process and um, to now make these junctions quite reliably with dimensions, um, I think, down to about 100 nanometers. And so, of course, um, the sort of first measurements we do was to make uh, four terminal devices um, and measure basically IV curves. And so what you can see is that <laughs> the, the, the critical current or switching current for these devices um, is from around 50 to 100 nanoamps down to basically zero as we uh, tune our side gate voltage, um, which is sort of in the range of currents that we wanted for high times on devices. Um, although it's worth noting that we don't understand you know, all the features in this data, um, particularly through these sort of funny uh, steps to slow the the switching current, um, and I think this, this has been seen by other groups who suggested um, this is basically due to the formation of sort of uh, normal domains within the nanowire. Um, but nonetheless, we were sort of you know sufficiently encouraged by these results to basically forge ahead and, and uh, try to make transmog qubits using these materials. So our, our first attempt is shown here. So what you can see, we have this large interdigitated capacitor. And then here is where we have this nanowire Gerson junction. And so, um, as is often the case, we, we couple this with cavity for uh, basically readout. And so, um, measuring this device, we could sort of see it was doing something, but it was, it was very unstable and, and quite theoretic. And, and so, our concern was that um, since the, the qubit is basically a floating object, um, it was basically charging up. And, and that was causing uh, problems. So, <coughs> so we basically decided to redesign this circuit. Um, and in this case, it was inspired by the sort of Exmon variant of the, the transmog qubit from the Santa Barbara group. And so what you can see is that <coughs> we now have this T-shaped island. And the capacitance of this to ground is the, basically the shunting capacitance for the transmog. And then down here, again, is where we have our uh, nanowire Gerson junction elements. And again, um, we coupled this transmog to a cavity for readout, um, and also in this case, microwave control. <laughs> so uh, the first measurement we do is basically look at the, the cavity response as we sweep the side gate voltage for the, the Gerson junction. And what you see is that um, you have a lot of these kind of funny wiggles in the cavity response. Um, and also some gate voltages you see that the, the cavity basically splits into two resonances. And, and so you can understand this response by basically, um, if you go back to these IV data, um, <coughs> what you see is that, that um, you have these uh, universal conductive fluctuations in the nanowire as you um, sweep the gate voltage. Um, and that gives you similar universal fluctuations in the critical current, um, which then result in, in the same fluctuations 
in the, the splitting of the qubit, um, which in turn pulls on the cavity, um, giving it a funny wiggle. <coughs> and, and where we see the, the, the cavity is basically splitting into these two pieces is where the, the qubit and, and cavity uh, both excited states are basically hybridized. So to sort of better understand this data, um, we can plot the, the, the splitting um, between the two peaks um, as a function of the, the qubit frequency, which you can also extract from our data. And what we see is that they fall nicely along this curve, and um, basically the minimum here corresponds to the, the qubit cavity coupling strength, uh, which is around about 100 megahertz. And what we can then do is, is take these data, and instead of plotting as a function of gate voltage, uh, we can plot as a function of the, um, the qubit frequency. Uh, then we can, uh, this is what we see, and um, here you can much more clearly see the sort of void crossing between the, the qubit and the cavity. So if we uh, then go to the regime in which the, the qubit and cavity frequencies are consumed, um, we can basically use the, the qubit, the, the cavity, the qubit form readout of the cavity, of the qubit. And um, so here, if we then use a second white microwave home uh, to basically try and excite the qubit, uh, we can do qubit spectroscopy as a function of gate voltage. Um, and again, you can see these uh, universal fluctuations. Um, and occasionally you see some sort of uh, switching events, uh, but for the most part, this, this spectrum is fairly smooth. Um, what you can then do is, if you basically sit at a fixed gate voltage, um, you can vary the length of your microwave burst to um, observe coherent radio oscillations in this spectrum as a function of the uh, qubit driving frequency. Um, and, and so, so doing the sort of rabbit drive corresponds to rotating around an axis in the xy plane of the box there. Um, but if, if you want to rotate about, rotate about the z axis of the box there, uh, you can do this um, by basically uh, pulsing the, the gate voltage to tune the qubit. And so here we sit at this point um, and we apply a, a pi over 2 microwave burst to rotate us to the xy plane, um, and then we then pulse our gate voltage, um, causing the, the qubit to basically um, persist at a frequency that is the, the distance between our, our the starting qubit frequency and, and the frequency that it ends up at. Um, and then after we apply this pulse, we apply a second uh, microwave pi over 2 pulse to rotate it out of the xy plane for, for readout. And <coughs> What you can basically see is a function of the, the pulse amplitude and time of these different oscillations, um, again around the z axis, um, as we, we apply these voltage pulses. And so, of course, what we're very interested in are the, the, the coherence times for this qubit. And so, if we, we sit at this point, um, we can apply a pi pulse to rotate it to the excited state, um, and then vary the waiting time before readout. Um, and, and from that decay, we can extract a lifetime that's around half a microsecond. Um, and we can also extract coherence times by doing a Ramsey measurement, um, which in this case gives you about uh, two T star with about a microse microsecond, um, which is basically two T one, um, suggesting that at least at this operating point, we're uh, lifetime limited. And so, of course, at, at this point, it's it's quite flat with respect to the gate voltage, um, suggesting it should be, you know, first order intensive for charge noise. Um, so we can then you know, go to some point in the slope. Um, and again, we expect a lifetime of around half a microsecond. But in this case, from the Ramsey experiment, uh, we see that coherence time um, has gone down to about half a microsecond. Um, but then if we add a sort of echo, additional echo pulse, we can uh, recover T2, which is about, again, about 2T1. And so this suggests that um, we you know, do have some sen uh, sensitivity to um, additional noise. Um, but at the moment, I think we're, we're largely limited um, by the, the short qubit lifetime. And we think there are, uh, you know, using a lot of established uh, sort of techniques and, um, and, and sort of materials. Um, 
optimization that the supercomputer group have developed. Uh, we, think we, we think we can substantially improve this uh, super lifetime. Um, and then hopefully once we've done that, that should um, enable us to you know, more carefully explore uh, the impact of fake polygonals on the super. Um, so yeah, with that I'll finish. Um, basically the, the sort of nanowire circuits that we integrate in the in the circuit fluid architecture is sort of you know a very interesting system for exploring lots of different physics, um, for photon emission and and uh, single spin dynamics, and of course we can also make the uh, gate tunable uh, transmodern qubits. Um, so that I'll finish and I'd be happy to take any